Welcome everybody back to the Martin Siegel Theater Center here at the Graduate Center CUNY in Midtown Manhattan. It's a Monday evening, 6.30 p.m. And traditionally in the days before the time of Corona, this we did all our live events and now as lessons we have learned in the time of Corona as we will have live events, but also go back to Zoom. And this is our first uh, in a season where we also have audience coming back to our space. But for tonight, it worked out that we have on the great HowlRound uh, TV a conversation. Tonight's uh, a topic is a very important one. It's a very significant one. It's a celebration of a book publication. And not only that we believe in the power and the importance and significance of books, it's also a, some a project we are feel very strongly connected. We have three theater artists with us. It's uh, uh, Mallory uh, Catlett, it's Aaron Lensman, and Ebony Noel Golden. And um, it's a book that is called um, The City We Make uh, Together. We're going to talk about it. It is uh, a project I admire very much. And it is a project that is participatory in, oh, there it is. Yes, I've already held up the capital. And it can be bought. Um, online. Um, online, yes, and um, and uh, and it's on a, a, a new reinterpretation of the thousands of year old idea of a democratic participation of citizens in theater. What you know, in a way, started with Greek theater, and now we come to a contemporary art, uh, art that uh, really is a new way to reinterpret tradition, to reconnect um, um, to it. And we're going to talk about it again, the city we make together, city council meetings, primer for participation by Mallory Cattle and Aaron Lensman. It's a project that's over four or five years. It's a, now uh, in a book form. It's an important project, and uh, we will talk about it. But first of all, uh, hello to everybody, Mallory, uh, Aaron, hello. and Ebony. How are you guys, and where are you? Um good i'm in new york city in my apartment <laughs> in hell's kitchen aaron uh i'm on the campus of princeton university where i teach part-time i consider this my fake background of a professor's office because i borrow this space fantastic and ebony hi everyone i am also in new york city in harlem glad to be here Glad to be here. And I see that on you. You have your reference to the Lenape land. And I think even so we are on the airwaves, I think it is important to be reminded the land we stand on and um, where we uh, uh, um, live and work and, um, and create. Um, it has been a lot of talk about your project, City Council Meeting. Let's say someone who has no idea um, what it is, Mallory in three, four, five sentences. It's not ballet. It's not a film. You know, it's not a British play. What's the idea that this radical idea you guys came up with or Aaron when he walked in Portland, Oregon, you know, trying to do it, get a theater meeting done and he walked into a city council meeting there, but maybe describe it in a few words. Now, what should I? Yeah, go ahead, yeah. Aaron. Yeah. Um, so I uh, was kind of dragged to a local government meeting in Portland. Um, this is about 2009. And um, I was kind of obligated to be there because the, one of the council members in Portland was considering funding another project of mine called Open House, um, which the Foundry Theater had done earlier in New York. And he said, you should stick around for uh, the local government meeting that's coming up because it's going to be super fun. And I was like, that seems impossible. Uh, and he said, no, this one's going to be really hot because it's about zoning. And I was like, case in point. And so I felt obligated, so I stuck around. And what I saw turned out to be some of the most exciting theater I'd seen in a long time. I saw an um, older kind of neighborly guy dump a bag of trash in front of the council. And he said, I pick this stuff every day in the kids zone. What are you gonna do to help me clean up the city? Um, the council member I had just spoken to said, well, you just created a public health hazard because it's a public meeting. And he said, well, you made my point better than I ever could have. Um, and that shut down the meeting as a form of protest. So that was the germination point. And from there, I went to Mallory. And um, I don't know if you want to pick it up from here, Mal, and talk about the, the piece at all. Sure. Um, yeah, so Aaron came to me and was, we just started talking about 
you know, a performance that would be transcript based. Um, and so, yeah, that's how it started. I was very interested. I do a lot of adaptation of like non-theatrical material. And so I'd never done a performance based on city council meeting transcripts. So I was like, bring it. Um, and um, yeah, we just started talking from there. I mean, I think I, Frank, I could just sort of read the show section, which I think- yeah. Please do. It really well. Mm -hmm. From the book, right? Who's publisher yeah. of the book? Uh, uh, University of Iowa Press. Mm -hmm. It's a series called Humanities in Public Life. Right. Yeah, I'll just read it. Um, okay, one of the first big decisions we made was that was that the audience should perform city council meeting. If the piece was first and foremost about civic participation, we wanted the form to lead us to a better understanding of why we do and do not participate. A big part of our inquiry became what else time and language can do beyond telling stories through characters. Before city council meeting, neither of us had worked with bureaucratic language or taken apart social and political structures, but there seemed to be a pathway in these dense and loaded speeches and procedures. We came up with three questions that guided us while making city council meeting. Um, how could an audience run a performance together with no preparation? How could civic procedures, which we normally associate with boredom and anime, draw our attention to a web of dramatic and interdependent relations and power dynamics? And how could we make a piece of participatory theater that we would enjoy, avoiding all of our experiences with that form in the past, in which we were often asked to join the make-believe acts of a group of well-rehearsed actors without any of their preparation. These questions helped us think about form, content, and context and at, at the same time. If our show is about participation and democracy, how can the invitation into the space, the kinds of people who shepherd you through it, and the way the script is printed, throw those issues into starker, more complex relief, while still being legible to you if you just walked off the street? Once we put these questions at the center of our process, we were able to build the piece around them. The orientation, a four minute video that asks the audience members to make a choice about how to participate in the performance as counselors who act as council members and speak most of the text, as speakers who get a piece of testimony, as supporters who don't speak but receive instructions and take actions, or as bystanders who simply watch as they would a performance. The meeting, a 75 minute procedure enacted by the audience with a group of trained staffers, both artists and non-artists comprised of local government meeting transcripts, excerpts edited together with some of Aaron's original writing. And this section looks and feels a little like a poetic riff on a real local government meeting and follows the structure of most government meetings we saw. The local ending, a 15 to 20 minute original performance created with and enacted by community members in each city where we presented the work. We often tried to get adversaries around a particular issue to cooperate on making this local ending with us. By cutting and splicing together bits and pieces of meetings in several cities, our theater work created an amalgam of the many places we visited, an archetypical, sorry, an, arch an archetypal local government meeting our city we made each night by performing it. We did this by figuring out what effects, situations, and structures might be common to most U.S. cities, even as the language and form change from place to place. Fantastic, <laughs> thank you. So if I recap it, <laughs> traditionally we go into the theater, we pay money, and we look at brilliant artists who st studied all their life to move, to dance, or speak a text. Uh, we, think about what they say and we applaud and we go home. This project, audience members participate. They come in a space, you have a reenactment of a real city council meeting, kind of the, a cornerstone, a foundational meeting of a democracy, um, or people, for the people, by the people, with the people. And you follow formalities uh, of a, a council meeting and you ask audience members of all ages, to uh, participate and often a 17 year old girl could read, you know, someone of a 65 year old uh, council member or the other way around, you know, someone 
um, reads, uh, was something like a very diverse audience. The work of Rimini Protocol comes to mind um, that opened up a lot of this work, the work of Milo Rao, um, his Moscow trial, his uh, Congo trials, and where he, he, he stages with real people, but in a structured way, a performative uh, a presentation and a theatrical experience for the audience. So it's a fantastic thing. We have uh, also with us Ebony, and I uh, wanted to come to you also uh, early on. Um, you're an artist, you work um, at Princeton University as an artist in residence, if I understand right, from um, um, grants you got and you know, have so highly recognized. Why of all the projects, and there are thousands, I would say 10,000s in America, you know, of artists who have idea what to do. Why do you say, this is interesting of me, for me, I would like to work with it. I would try to implement it, create perhaps even a um, curriculum around it. Yeah, this, um, well, thank you for, for having me this evening. Um, this process of participating in local government is one that is very near and dear to my heart. Um, I'm often making work uh, creatively and also strategically that looks to um, the people, to the community as resources for social activation and social change. And so this project, um, and really my role at Princeton is as an entrepreneur in residence. Um, and I'm working with Mallory and with Aaron on how this, this book and this methodology can um, scale up and go out into more communities beyond arts communities, beyond school communities to really reach in deep into our neighborhoods to activate folks that are wanting to work block by block, neighborhood by neighborhood for um, local change. This is interesting to me because um, from a scholarly perspective, as well as from a creative perspective, I am very interested in how government performs. So from a performance studies perspective, how do systems perform and how do people as actors within those systems shift them? And so the idea of participation is, is um, an activist imperative, it's an intellectual imperative, and I also see it as a subversive imperative. Um, you know, everyday people who come into places, into, into city council meetings and dump trash in the middle of a meeting are meant to disrupt some of the norms and the ways that government performs and that we just kind of, you know, we, we have rested there. So the idea that each, each city council meeting and each variation of this is a new way of understanding ourselves politically, socially, culturally is one that's of interest to me. Um, I'll just say also that the idea of participating in local government being an arts enterprise is one that is quite, um, is quite enlivening. Oftentimes when we think about the place of art in, and social change, we think about it from a nonprofit perspective. We think about it from an under-resourced perspective, unless we are you know, talking about big commercial theater. But the idea of communities of performers, of, of government performers in, in, in that regard, of, of those who are thinking about moving and shifting how we, um, how we make policies and practices that impact our everyday lives. For those folks to be able to sustain these practices beyond an artistic you know, leaning um, is one that also is exciting to me and one that I wanna help support and scale out into um, nationally all over the country. Yeah, wow, that, um, that, that is a fantastic uh, a project. And um, I like the idea of this project so very much, if I may say, the very, very first rehearsal for the rehearsal actually happened at the Siegel Center uh, at one of our prelude uh, festivals. Morgan was a co-curator. Aaron has been with us and also Mallory many times, but this was a very special one, one could feel it um, right away. The museums, galleries, theaters are highly symbolic spacious spaces with imagination, of course, the area, but they also fought over what do we represent in it? How do we use the time of the audience watching and what do we really present? And, and I think, as we had the talk earlier, two weeks ago with Michael Clean and Corey Tamler, it was the idea of their uh, parliament. 
um, this kind of socially participatory art project in theater and performance where audiences are emancipated spectators, as Ronsier said, and you quote him often, is of significance. People perform democracy in a way, but here they really perform it. Um, Aaron, if I can uh, come to you, um, how, how did you dream this up? Uh, I know you said you saw a Wooster Group performance when you walked into that um, um, space, but you said, I would like to reenact what they are doing because it is so important. Um, how did you uh, dream that up and what, uh, what forms, what rules, what methods, what do you use to make this happen in different spaces? It's hard to think that a Portland, Oregon medium works in Texas and in Florida and in New York. Tell us a little bit. Sure. Well, one of the things that um, has been great about first working with Mallory and then joining forces with Ebony um, to think about the different forms that this project could take is that I think all of us start with the assumption that there is a lot of um, knowledge, power, and creativity already in communities. So there were a number of ways like that I was interested in engaging this material. One was I found I was just started visiting local government meetings whenever I was traveling like to teach or to perform with someone else. And there was always some moment that was relatively theatrical. And it might be like a going away speech by a counselor in Bismarck, North Dakota that we used in the piece or churches complaining about a new drainage proposal in Houston and all the layered politics of how the churches and how real estate was influencing public policy there. But it always came back to um, the communities that we were visiting were not places that we felt like we needed to um, give something to that they didn't already have. Um, so I feel like the interest from all of us, but that was a guiding point was like, there was a lot of language in the arts community about things like creative placemaking. Um, and I felt a little bit of, um, I felt a little bit of a resistance in myself because I often thought, well, there's already places there. And that even if it, under the best of intentions, um, sometimes projects that get headed under community engaged work or creative placemaking specifically by artists who might be white, might be coming from New York or from a major urban center to another place, um, might not already come with the idea that we have to recognize that the, the knowledge is already in the room. And maybe what our job is, is to put a frame around it. So if I think about the Worcester group, Liz LeCompte's phrase that always sticks with me is, she feels her job as a director is to put a frame around the actors' lives. And in this case, the actors we were working with were audience members. Sometimes they were strangers to us or new friends, and sometimes they were strangers to each other. Um, sometimes they came from different walks of life. So the challenge with the theater piece was what is the best, most respectful, most empowering way to put a frame around this particular place using the tools of these transcripts, of some of the texts that we wrote together of the idea of a local ending and adversaries. So one thing I could read real quick, if that's okay, is um, mm -hmm. there's just like a two page series of questions in the book. Um, we call questions them, you uh, ask the participants or questions you no, ask yourself? These are, these are questions we ask ourselves um, and that kind of emerged throughout the process. And then I think one of the things that led us to want to write the book was that there was still energy left in the process, but there was not necessarily the resources to realize like a fully done version of the piece because it was pretty you know we would make two or three visits to a city um, spend I think in Houston we spent probably like 15 weeks there over the course of a couple of years the minimum we spent was eight or nine weeks just developing relationships and building material so the book comes out of a desire to say this process happened there are some mistakes we made and there's some things we got right and this list of questions kind of emerged from that so mm -hmm. um, it's just a couple of pages um, and it goes like this uh, as we worked on city council meeting, we came up with a list of questions that we think are helpful for theater practitioners and teachers to consider when making their own works. We also hope this can be of use to humanities research. How can you question not only the content or form of the research, but also the context and history within, your, within which your work resides? This list is a beginning. There are more questions that might be specific to one or another discipline or situation. We hope these serve as a starting point. What sort of rooms or spaces should this performance or class or interview be held in? What role does this space have in this particular city, town, or neighborhood? What kinds of performances already take place here? Meetings, book groups, plays, conferences, sales pitches, love affairs. 
how does our role as insiders or outsiders in this community impact how the work might be received and how can we include community members or texts to reflect that? How do we account in our process for differences in geography, ethnicity, race, gender identity, or other markers of power and privilege? What role does language play in this work? Is there anything about language that we wanna show more clearly? How do we do that? Who should perform this piece? Should they be skilled in performance techniques? How will their level of skill impact audience members who may be asked to join the performance or may want to whether they're asked or not? How do we make the script most usable by the people we think should perform? Is there theater jargon that, where, that we could do without? Is there another way to say upstage left? How does communication function in our performance? Can people really listen to each other? How can we rehearse and enact listening rather than simply representing it? What are we assuming and can we make our assumptions plain so that they can be improved upon by our artist and non-artist collaborators? What commonly assumed rules about seeing performances or conducting field research or teaching a course might impact how people experience what we're doing? Do we need to address those rules, break them or honor them or all of the above? How much money do we have? What are our priorities? And can we avoid exploiting professional art workers and non-professional participants alike? And how long will this towel take to do right, really? Does it have to fit into the semester or annual constraints of presenting seasons and academic years? And what other work already does or has done what we wanna do? So those are questions that I feel like we wanted to offer because they were kind of in our brains as we were working. And then it found, it, it, it feels interesting to ask those of colleagues and ask those of students. Um, I teach a freshman seminar here at Princeton that recreates our process, but we look at meetings in Princeton town and Trenton and Hamilton, and then engage some of these same questions when we figure out what kind of final performance to make. Yeah, I just wanna jump in and just to say that there's the performance and then, so the book is really to explain what the performance was, but it also, um, it also wants to invite a wider group of people who may who may um, want to embody their research, right? And to give them some questions. And this this is an example of some questions. We talk about our budget. We talk about, like Aaron mentioned, a lot of the mistakes that we made. Um, and it's really to kind of invite people to to think about how they might embody their research in a way and make what they're trying to do more participatory on one end. So people who may not be theater people and on the other side, theater people who like might want to use their toolkit to, you know, go out of the theater, <laughs> right? Into communities. So it's sort of working from those directions in. Um, and so the book is really trying to kind of share what we learned, um, the mistakes that we made, and that's those questions are a really good um, mm -hmm. example of that. And I think I think like it was a it was a performance piece, then it was a book, and then we're thinking about the curriculum, and that is another iteration that that comes out of this. So it's a project that like uh, has has many iterations, and that's just that's why we want to talk to you about it <laughs> yeah and i'll just say mm -hmm. i'll just say also the idea of everyday people who are not in the theater and not in the government being more you know in a space of embodying what they really feel what they really believe and leaning into that is something else that the book i think you know helps people to understand what does it mean to be in your own practice? What does it mean to be in your own practice and service of your everyday life, your quality of life, your neighborhood, your community? And so there, there are a, a number of entry points into not just the, you know, the book, but also the, the methods that come along with doing this type of work that um, are resources for everyday people. Yeah, it's a really, it is actually a really great resource. Why I admire that project also is um, the democratic process it uses in producing the work. So many plays we see, you know, are about the idea of collaboration and we all have to, you know, work together and do something. But often it's the author, the authoritarian voice, one director, you know, who imposes its will. 
actors have to say what's given to them. Rene Polish, a great Berlin director at the Volkswagen, who actually runs it, always felt bad about it and said, I'm going to uh, distribute text. And actors can actually choose what they want to say. And um, I write sometimes for them. They write something and they can also reject it. That was his contribution because he said, how can I write a play? What he said is anti-capitalist, anti-hierarchical, you know, but the way I be, I'm paid more, he says then. He tries to have and I tell people what to do. So how can that be here in this project? It is not only about the democratic process, it actually shows it by the people and people participate. I think it's a, almost like a Robin Hood uh, that, you know, the, the arrow is split in the middle that goes into, I think, what we need. And we need participation in our democracy. We need uh, that people um, um, act, not only show what is wrong, but we have to also then act upon what we do, and but also then work, truly participate. Just again, to bring it a bit down, Ebony, did you participate as a participator in one of the council meetings? And tell me if you did, how does it look like? You come in a room, everybody sits there, or, and then Mallory gives a talk, and how long does it, how does that work? How can we imagine a city council meeting? So I've been to many city council meetings, not one with Mallory and Aaron specifically, but I have seen Aaron Aaron's class at Princeton, um, you know, perform their version of city council meeting. And it's quite entertaining, I should say. I mean, down to there's popcorn for people and you get to everyone in the room gets to choose a role. And everyone, um, you know, of course, there are play people who are performing. I was an audience member um, and, and some folks, you know, got up and gave testimonies about certain things that were happening. The part of the this the, the process, the performance that I really lean into is the local um, the local issue moment right at the end where in this case, Princeton students were talking about something that seemed to be very important to them. The topic seemed to be very important to them and it actually shifted what I was feeling and experiencing in the room because we went from, you know, Professor Landsman's, you know, syllabus to the things that are really inside of the hearts and minds of, of, of these students, which I was just like, oh, this just got very deep. I can, I can tell that we've entered another domain. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, the idea from my understanding and from what I, of course, I'm very, in, I'm very deep inside of the archive of this work because of the work that I am doing um, in, in service of, um, in service of thinking about how to build this curriculum and build an enterprise that really supports this work scaling out. Um, I'm inside of the, uh, inside of the archive, inside of Aaron and Mallory's work, but also inside of the um, you know many folks who have used this process of bringing in a legislative you know kind of performance Augusta Boal's work really speaks to me and so the idea of using documents using archive using research as a way to more understand who we are as people and the systems that we move in um, that's that's where I've been I will say though the students freshmen this is the this is a freshman course. The students' capacity, I think, to you know, get inside of, and all of these folks are not theater students or, no, or performers, yeah. and so, but their ability to get inside of this process and and to bring this to an audience reminds me of the power of storytelling and what happens when you know people have the space to be creative, regardless of what they do in their everyday lives. And I saw, um, I witnessed a leaning in among these young people in a different way because they've had the scaffolded syllabus and interaction with all of the aspects of the work. And that's the kind of young people I want to be, you know, informing our government and informing our school systems and so on and so forth. Those who have an understanding of, of building story, sharing story, as well as the legislative process. Yeah, I'll also just, I also just want to say that I think that city council meeting like formally and and you're asking about like how the instructions work i think like one of the things is that the focus is always like how do you keep an audience's focus on the system mm -hmm. right 
I think this is like, this is what's really, and this is a sort of Brechtian thing, right? It's like, you know, how do we look at something and think that the acting style was was created in such a way because he wanted the audience to think, well, he did that, but he could have done that, right? As opposed to another kind of acting style where it just seems inevitable, right? That I do right. this, and do this, and, and we get pulled in and have a catharsis and everything, as opposed to like being able to sit back with our cigar and watching people make choices and thinking, well, it could have gone this way or it could have gone that way. So I think that the, for us, it's really like all of the, a lot of the choices that we made were to keep the audience thinking about like, well, why did I make this choice as opposed to this choice? And so it, it's, it's a lot about trying to, because I think, I think I know when I work with students, what's really difficult is not this idea of a single person doing one thing or another, but what's really, what's really difficult is how do we change systems, right? <laughs> Not how do we change systems? That is like one of the most difficult things, questions we can ask ourselves, right? And mm -hmm. so I think the point of the way that we structured city council meeting was really like, how do we always keep the focus of the audience on the system? Like it's working in this way. How do I feel within the system right now? I've made this choice. Why did mm -hmm. I make this choice? How is this room making me feel? How am I judging others? How How is this bureaucracy empowering certain people and not other people? Um, so I think that that's, that's one of the things I think is really important mm -hmm. um, in, in how we kind of dreamed up a lot of these like rules and regs and trying to get people because we did in a way people did have to say you know they did have to say what other people said right and but part of that wasn't just to like because we liked it or we thought it was the best thing but we wanted them to interact with and push up against rules and structures mm -hmm. right so yeah. that they would have to sit there and feel how do I feel about this? What's going on with me internally in this moment? Because it's a it's a huge reason of why people don't go to these meetings, right? They don't have to negotiate. They don't want to negotiate all that stuff, right? In the face of the system. And I think that's sort of like the, um, like that. that's why we gave people different options to sit. I made a choice. They couldn't change their mind, right? I made mm -hmm. a choice to do this. And now- I have to like sit with that and make sense of this based on how I'm choosing to be within the system. And hopefully they're thinking about, mm -hmm. well, you know, yeah, it's a system that works in this way. It could work a different way. And I think a lot of the ways that we, one of the reasons we use the mixture of city council transcripts, but also what Aaron, Aaron's own writing is an intercession was so that there was a little voice in there of questioning why is it working this way and could it work some other way and so that's one of the reasons that we chose this kind of collage of different cities and this kind of interceding voice um that mm -hmm. just kind of encouraged the audience to kind of feel their feelings and think their thoughts and question what was you know these rules I want to also just say <laughs> that yeah. Mallory, you know, you got me thinking, right? Because we're on the precipice of a big political year, a big voting year. And to think about how people come awake, you know, um, and how people come out of the, some people are kind of apathetic about government and apathetic about these the decisions that are being made because they don't feel like they can actually make an impact. And that is why scaling up this work and these methods is so important. Not because we want folks to vote one way or the other, but we want folks to be active in their own communities and their own decision making. And so to, you know, to bring in the conversation of, you know, from from different cities and to bring in the um, capacity for folks to under more understand the system might, you know, move people to want to be more involved, um, not just in a big political year, but year round. Yeah, maybe yeah. one last thing I'd like to add is, um, Ebony, you mentioned the local ending and with the students, 
there was a sense, um, and I think this was true in the city, so that the piece, and I think the book reflects the order of the piece, um, there were a lot of rules to the beginning part to the meeting and you had to follow those rules basically, or if you broke them, it was really interesting, but not necessarily part of the plan. And then there was an intermission, we reset the space and the ending in the cities where we performed the kind of more, the earliest version of the piece was getting these adversaries to agree to make something with us, not to solve a problem, but just to sort of ask, I think Mallory talked about like, what could art do that a local government meeting couldn't do in terms of illustrating how a community lives with itself. And so that ending gesture was often like much more theatrical. It may have been kind of like um, not super technically or um, design wise, not huge, but we often like reversed the facing of the audience. One city, we had a forest of ficus trees that you walked back in on. Another city involved an opera at the top of the audience risers with the audience on stage. Um, other city, uh, you know, other cities like in New York, we made a, um, a fake standardized test for the audience to fill out where all the questions were philosophical and all the answers were correct. So it was a way of complicating um, what we had just been through by showing something that was kind of its inverse. And in Princeton, it was very interesting because everybody could really get behind understanding the bureaucracy and the language of systems. And at the same time, the system was, the, the semester last semester was particularly hard here. Um, and the, the, there were safety and protection issues around for different reasons. And the students really kind of had this moment of like, oh, we can talk about what we need to talk about here in a way that we choose. So they made a whole very short local ending um, in the night that Ebony saw around how the university was responding to safety issues and how that made them feel. And it really flipped things. Like it made, the, it made us all go, oh, that, that language that seemed maybe funny or mundane or boring or procedural actually has consequences because they were, um, because they were addressing like the way that one of the systems that we were exploring, which is the university was imposing itself on them. And they were doing it in a way that was like very different from what a council meeting does. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, it is Precht and Mallory uh, mentioned it in that idea of an educational play, a Lehrstück, where your actors demonstrate. They don't, you know, go on their childhood emotions, you know, and have breakup. They demonstrate what happened, as Brecht famously said, you witness a uh, bicycle accident on the street. The policeman say, what happened? You show. And you show just what you need to understand and you don't need to know the life of uh, with the driver of the car to understand and make a judgment for witnesses um the idea that it's democratic um that it encourages um uh, participation in a society uh, where it is endangered at the moment you say we are in one of the book com comments you said you know we're at the end of an empire we come to an end of the epoch of rights it is endangered and i think to remember uh, where civilization comes from to participate in it. The theater is on the part of social progress on justice. Um, and in the participatory way is of uh, uh, true importance. And I think this is what makes this project so important and also um, so unique. Mallory, again, for our audience who haven't seen it, how, how big is the room? How small? How long? So you walk in, you get a script, you tell them, you go here and there. I know there's a video screen. Oh, um, yeah. Some speeches, you know, are prepared. Um, how long does that take if someone wants to participate? Does the audience come in the evening? Others prepare for two weeks? Um, no, it's a so, little bit an idea. Okay. <laughs> so, well, I mean, basically you come and you watch this orientation video, which which we kind of riffed off of like the do you have that video yes or you can yes do you want can we watch it is that yeah yeah here you go thanks We're for asking, it up. frank it's so everybody who comes in at 7 p.m to see the show sees that yeah yes. it's, it's modeled a bit after um jury duty orientation um and this is from san francisco so we worked with a local um supervisor which is their equivalent of um okay so every audience member comes in the room sits on a chair yeah. the setup of a council meeting and watches this video. Yeah, yeah, and it's on two monitors that are on either side of the council table. Good. Hello, I'm Supervisor John Apollos. In the Book of Laws, the Greek philosopher Plato lists seven qualifications required for governing and for being ruled. The first four are based on what he calls a natural difference, the difference of birth, parents over children, the old over the young, nobles over serfs, and masters over slaves. The fifth, Plato calls the principle of principles, 
or the power of those with a superior nature, the strong over the weak. But for Plato, the only one really worth discussing is the sixth one, the power of those who know over those who do not. So you have four categories based on hard facts. I was born before you. I was born richer than you. I own your land. I own you. But these aren't as good as the two more theoretical pairs, natural superiority and the rule of science. I'm better than you, or I know more than you. Boom. You'd think that was enough, but here's the thing. Plato lists a seventh category. It's something he refers to as the drawing of lots or the qualification of no qualification. This is a form of government only a god could save, democracy. So welcome to city council meeting, where no one is qualified to be in charge, or everyone is. God help us. By joining us tonight, you'll be standing in for someone who was actually part of a local government meeting somewhere in the U.S. in the last three years. You will be as involved as you'd like. I've never been to a city council meeting before. Is that a problem? No, you do not need special qualifications. There are several ways to participate. One, you can be a counselor. Counselors sit at the council table and conduct the meeting. We have room for six counselors. Two, you can be a speaker. Speakers receive a piece of testimony that was given by someone at an actual city council meeting. Speakers sit at the testimony table and speak directly to the counselors. If you want to be a speaker, we'll need your name so we can call you up to give your testimony. Three, you can be a supporter. Supporters don't have to speak, but get simple instructions like stand up, applaud, answer your phone, or get up and leave the room for a few minutes. The kinds of activities that take place at any local government meeting. Or you can be a bystander. Bystanders are people who just want to observe. If you're a bystander, we'll need you to exit the room until the meeting begins. Throughout the meeting, there will be staff on hand to guide you or in case you have a problem. If you've got a smartphone, you can have a Twitter conversation with the meeting using the hashtag CityCouncilMTG. Once I make my decision, can I go back and change it? No. Sometimes city council meeting can seem like just a bunch of procedures and paperwork. Sometimes there's no way to know if you're doing it right. People want so many different things. Sometimes city council meeting can seem like, is anyone driving this boat? The answer most of the time is no. Right now, if you look around you, you'll see you're a part of a group that has never done this before. Some people get to city council meeting and go, wait a minute. I thought I'd get to speak my mind. I thought I'd be engaging in dialogue. You know what? You do get to engage in dialogue, but it's a dialogue that has already happened among other people somewhere else. You're just filling their shoes for a little while. Why? Because we think it's more interesting. Or you might feel like, hey, didn't you just say I was in charge? The fact is you are in charge. You're deciding at every moment how to participate. That's the kind of power isn't it? And maybe it's worth pointing out that our third collaborator, Jim Finley, um, who's not here, was our production designer um, and basically did something that he, he likes to call invisible design. So when you walk in the room, it really looks like it's two folding tables, it's some um, name cards and two regular old TV monitors that play this video and then show live clips of the action as it's happening after people make their choice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah I Jim, mean, Jim actually said, I have to create obstacles, right? As a, that's right. As a, as a um, yeah, Mallory. I mean, I just wanted to say that we decided early on that we wanted to make sure that when you looked at the room, it, you, you would have basically, we traveled with a, like a rolling suitcase that had all the props but we wanted people to look at the room and go like oh that's in the church basement that's in the library all of those stuff that the school has that 
you know, I mean, we did, it does have a, like a five camera live shoot. So there is a, a technical thing, but like, it's not, it's not a particularly, it's not like you're looking at a set. It's like, you're looking at the room and what you need really um, to like it, the, the materials are things that exist in many kind of shared community spaces, basically. Mm -hmm. And that again, is just making sure we, we just want it at every turn because we're asking the audience to do something they may or may not feel comfortable is that they would feel like, oh, okay, I have this, I could do that, right? So we didn't wanna put up a lot of like barriers even visually or aesthetically to make people feel like, oh, maybe I'm like, I don't understand what's happening here. And there is a script, right? So there is like in a play, there is a script. Yes, but the um, one of the things that Jim did early on, when we, we first started prototyping it, um, we had a script, but we found that the people in the city council meeting, they would just sit there and look at it and just like flip through it. And so they didn't listen to each other. They didn't. So Jim was like, no script. How do we have no script? And so we were like, at first it was like, oh, but then it was like, oh, this is going to be fun because we gave each council meeting, each council member a staffer and they, we found all these ways in which they deliver whatever needs to be said at the moment it needs to be said so that the audience can really like sit in the experience and really has to listen and wait. And that created this great dynamic with the staffers who really like, so the city council members each have their own staffer. So that person is working with them to, you know, shepherd them through. And so the staffer that, gives them a script, what they're going to say in that moment. It's on cards. The script is on all sorts of things. It's on cards. It's on an award someone gets. It's on, like, it became really fun to figure out, like, how to deliver what needed to be said in the moment that it needed to be said. It was like a very, and that's kind of the stuff that we go through in the book is just, once you have that limitation, you know, you can be like, well, this is impossible. Or you can be like, wow, this is going to be fun, right? That Like it really invites, it invited a lot of, for me, a lot of creativity and a lot of innovation, right? Because you realize that was going to be really important because no one wants to sit and look at people, you know, flipping through. And then they just didn't, they, they would just spend the whole time trying to prepare what they thought how to act it as opposed to like they have to say the thing in the moment right so the performance of it was also more interesting if they were really listening and really engaging in the moment with whatever needed to happen with the instructions mm -hmm. and weirdly, Fantastic. like mm -hmm. oh, go ahead uh, a, a question I had for um, for Ebony, um, I mean, Mallory talked and both Aaron about the system that you show a system, you know, like in Gal Brecht's Galileo when he says about Sprite's idea that we show systems of society away from individual faiths, you know, they says there's the chandelier moving in the Galileo because it's a, a particular movement from the earth. And uh, the American idea, you know, get therapy, um, you, you know, or um, do workout, you know, and create an app and your life is better. You know, even the climate change industry that says, oh, your carbon footprint, you know, if you only do that, you know, then it will be better. Instead of really saying there is a system we are in and the system is not working. And people do focus on their individual approach or individual happiness instead of, you know, participating in that thing. So my question to um, Ebony is, um, as an honor, man, do you believe this works? Do you believe participants who come to civil council meeting and get these pieces of paper they read and they are a council member or they are whatever give a speech and um, and uh, are in the government sense you're performing of self in the everyday life perform what they are performing in everyday life someone else did does that work? Does it does something happen with? Well, if I you asked if I believe if it works, yes. and I absolutely do. If I didn't, I wouldn't be sitting here right now speaking with you all. Yeah. So how does it work? How how do you see it? Well, here's the thing. I, I am a firm believer of you rehearse the world that you want to live in, and you rehearse it by understanding these these, these types of dynamics that are complicated, that are convoluted that really get at the 
nuances of what it means to live in this country, you know? And, and whether we choose to be bystanders, whether we choose to be counselors, whether we, whether we feel like we haven't had a choice, the idea of being in a situation or scenario that comes through with city council meeting as a performance and as a methodology is one that allows us to, you know, allows audiences, students, participants of many sorts to re-engage. And this is the thing that I think is most um, exciting for me about getting this opportunity in front of more people is the opportunity to really consider what does it mean to be um, less of a spectator and more of an actor in your own life. Um, and I have seen what it means for folks to be able to, for young people, for communities to be able to collectively, you know, take a part and understand what, um, and research what is happening that is governing their everyday lives. And that has been, you know, a way in which people have become more active. I've seen this as an activist. I've seen this as a teacher, you know, to ask people to be involved in something that they really don't understand. Um, it's very challenging, but once you understand it and understand that this system is supposed to be for us, it's supposed to work for us and with us, then something changes. I've seen it happen. Um, and so, and so, yeah, I do believe that this works. I do believe that this idea of the forum as a democratic process is one that is is super important to you know reengaging and reactivating um, people as neighbors, people as 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 students, as as actors, as performers, as artists. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I want to pass it to Aaron. Aaron was about to say something. Did you I want mean, to say Yeah, the only, the only thing maybe I'd add is um, that makes me, Frank, your question, Ebony, your answer, makes me think that, or something that's been on my mind with this work is um, there's often a kind of perceived like tension between, do we try to change the system from without or do we try to change the system from within? That's one of them. And also is the system corrupt or oppressive enough that we shouldn't bother with it versus um, we should work within the system and, and, and try to change things from, from that. And I see this project at its best as functioning as a kind of both and, meaning we can put a frame around the system and show its oppressiveness, and we can also work within it. And for me, long-term, because I think of all the projects that I take on, Mallory and I were talking about this, and I would imagine that Ebony you might think of yourself this way too as a practitioner is that all of it is long-term, right? City council meeting is a 10, 15 year project if you look at all the forms that it takes. Um, I have another project called Perfect City which is a 20 year art and engagement project at Abrams. Um, and the right goal now, is right? That, isn't, that, isn't that happening right now? It is happening, right? But yeah, we have a big uh, thing coming out in June, a uh, kind of series of events. But the goal I think is to say like from within the system, if we recognize the problems that the structure holds, we can actually start to change the structure both from within and from the consciousness that we have of it from seeing it from without. Um, so I feel like that's maybe part of the goal is to honor the fact that it doesn't work for people and that not working is part of the design. And there's a potential in it that I think Ebony you're speaking to, um, which is that it's, it says it's supposed to, you know? And if we kind of take it to task from working both with inside and outside, I think that's the goal. Yeah, and I, I also think like that's also the, there's also a thing about each iteration, right? So I think we're so fortunate to be working with Ebony because of that belief, that just strong belief, because the the curriculum is really trying to enact, right, a kind of impact that the performance or the book may not have had. So So for me that, that each each iteration, so the the piece of art is, you know, it's like um, what it what was our intention with city council meeting is different than the book and is different than than the curriculum. Where the curriculum will be the most instrumentalized right aspect of the project, where we have to go in and absolutely with this belief that that it's working towards this change and towards this awareness where with the book and with the performance it's it 
it's slightly different, right? So, so that's, I think, also what's interesting about the process and the iterations is the kind of instrumentalization of the ideas is also different in each, in each, um, in each iteration. And I think there's a goal, there, or there's a thing to point out in what Mallory said, which is that like this piece started as a, as an experiment in a form. Right. I saw something and then I brought that to Mallory and it was like, this is an interesting form. It reveals something about our interests, but it wasn't necessarily to make the kind of impact we're talking about now, but it just sort of has led through an evolution and through thinking and talking and writing to something that could have that impact. I think I'm just putting that in there as a plug for both this kind of socially engaged participatory work that we all are invested in, as well as like the formal experiment that's kind of like a bunch of people going, what if? Because that's also the background that I think all of us come from as well. Yeah, yeah. I, and I'll, I'll say I'll say that you know in in the realm of of culture strategy that I, I dabble in um, from time to time, that there's an idea um, that art can help to bring awareness, art can help to create conversations, can help to shift the hearts and minds of people. And along that continuum of impact, we get to shifting the individual, but then we get to shifting the systems, the behaviors of people and the behaviors of systems. And there's a, a piece of this that I think, you know, really lends itself to a deeper, um, to more conversation about, you know, as we're talking about what does it mean to shift systems and systems are, you know, these kind of animated bodies doing their thing on its on their own, we are a part of what makes a system be that thing. And so the idea that we can change, you know, how we behave, how we feel, how we move, how we talk, means that we can also get inside of what is working and what isn't working with these systems and change them as, as well. If that means dismantling them and getting to the other side of that, then there is you know, a thought about that, but the idea is that we, we understand that change is elemental, that change is um, and, you know, personal, and, and it, it, re it requires that before we can get to the outer. So yeah. Mallory, I'll pass it back to you. <laughs> I can't even remember. So you must have just taken me, taken me in the right direction. It'll come back. Mm. It'll come, we'll back. come back. What I would like to just throw in, there's a lot about theater and politics, political theater. This is politics and theater as close as it gets, you know, in a way. It's a reinterpretation of, um, of, of, a, of a work of a Piscat or of a living theater, you know, of a, of a, a Brecht, um, of a Boal and an updated version, a contemporary version that really also takes spectators as collaborators, as emancipated spectators, as uh, Rancière, the French philosopher, who also was in our Siegel program, and what he said, but a question to all three of you, what are the theoretical frameworks? Who do you look at? What did you read? Uh, in that research to come to this uh, project? Um, you know, I think it's one of the interesting things I learned is that is that um, theater artists learn Aristotle and visual artists learn Plato. And so I never really knew about Plato's skepticism of these Aristotelian ideas, which are at the heart of Western theater practice. And I don't think I understood that the, there was always this debate with- The deep Plato. distrust of Plato yes, towards the arts yes, and also exactly. the performing arts, especially Aaron, as, as not natural as fake, right? Yeah, and Aaron's father, I mean, Aaron grew up with Plato. So that was something I learned a lot about. And I think I learned that through Ranciere's use of like, so, I mean, for me, the, the Plato aspect, which I was not, I just was not educated in that. And, and then the way Ranciere frames it was really key of just, and it's a, it's a thing I use often with, with in teaching with students is about how really to really investigate what your relationship with an audience is and to unpack all the assumptions that you may have learned or why you what motivates you to do what you do is this is this um and so that was really important for me to 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 work with Ranciere and to really like 
try to question all the assumptions I carried with me and how to unravel all that so that we could actually try to like have a conversation of, across what he calls these irreparable distances, right? That That is actually, um, and and to to make a multifaceted performance where everybody could have there was a boundary there was a sense of autonomy you know that we were we were working with autonomous people doing something together and that was very you know that was really key for me um and i would say just to add to that you know um i mallory i like the way you phrase it because it sounds like Plato and I were childhood friends. We grew up. Um, my dad was a, um, partly a philosophy professor, um, among other things. And um, the other readings that I think we did that were helpful were Irving Goffman, um, the 50s sociologist who's Canadian, who wrote the presentation of self in everyday life and basically applied dramaturgical terms to a lot of different kinds of behaviors. And he specifically was really interested in power and how we perform power. And then, um, the, uh, there was another, uh, uh, Robert Futrell was a scholar who built on uh, Goffman who wrote about one city's um, local government meetings over the course of a year using Goffman's framework. So that was really helpful to see those power structures play out locally in these kind of seemingly informal behaviors. The last person I wanna shout out to is um, Greg Snyder, who's a Baruch professor now, wrote a book um, and does participatory ethnography. Um, he works with subcultures and basically tried to change the way in his work, the kind of top down approach to sociology that is often done where there are subjects, there's a researcher, um, and there's a, a lot of status and power that are problematic within that role. So when we made our local ending, we often interviewed people. And I used Greg's approach, um, just because I knew him through his writing and through working together, honestly, at a restaurant, um, where I would interview someone and not take notes and not put a recording device on, then I would go back and write what I remembered the next day. And then I would show it to that person and say, does this sound like you? Um, and I might even have ideas about how we might build on what we talked about, but they could say that's total BS or I like this part, but not that part, or I wanna rethink this, or yeah, that sounds like me. Um, and what was pretty magical for me about that was that I could remember more than I would think, but also we were then co-authoring because often the people that I interviewed were performing their own texts, their, their own lives, their, their stories. And so it led to a lot of really um, creative choices that I probably wouldn't have made if I had had the recording device. And if I had not been beholden to that subject to say, do you trust me with this? You know, so that was another mm -hmm. part of it, finding research that allowed us to build common language and also trust. Mm -hmm. And kind of a new listening, a deep listening. Um, and we have to listen in new ways and in different ways. One of the last questions, Mallory, you also co-run the Mabu Minds, uh, a, a project, a very significant, you know, that we lost Libra um, not too long ago. It's a significant uh, um, um, group of work. Uh, you are in the old PS122, now it's the performance space. How does this work fit in? Um, does it influence what you do? Is it something different? Or is it just you play in a jazz band and you're in a classical piece? How, how, how does that work? How do you combine all this? I mean, I always think that, like, for me, the legacy of Mabu is very artist-centered and also in a, innovate, like, where artists were given the space and the time to, like, prepare to to do the work, to do the work, and to explore it in, in whatever avenue they wanted to go. And I think, like, for me, I feel like what I learned about city council meeting was this, once you embrace these limitations, it is actually the key to innovation is what I, is what, what, what I really learned if, okay, so the audience has to perform and there's no script. Suddenly I had all these, these newer ideas that I'd never had before. And so I do think that when I think about the, you know, Mavo Minds, they, they, a lot of their early work was like, okay, we're going to, there were these strict limitations or these like strict ways of studying form and content, right? And then they just had the space and time to push it and push it until the thing emerged. So, I mean, I guess, I guess that's how I, I, I feel like there's a, there's a something in the practice, which is about really in allowing yourself to indulge in the limitation or whatever that curiosity that you have is and to see it as the key to like 
formally because I think one of the interesting things about Mao's history is that they were formally innovative, right? I mean, they did just some plays, but they ended up using media. They ended up people were seeing theater in di a different form than they had experienced it before. So it's a continuation in a way yeah, of a so formal for me, experience. Yeah. yeah. So for An me, experiment. I feel, mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel very comfortable there because I feel like the history of the places people were like, well, I just had this. I want to explore this kind of thing and I want to push it, push it, push it until a new form emerges. And so that makes me feel very like you could just feel it in the place, you know, mm -hmm. like and they know how to like we know we want to give other artists those resources and that that space in a way and that philosophy. We would kind of want to bring that to the table for other artists, for younger artists. So I guess that's a way I would say. Yeah. Yeah, and I think Lee Brewer would agree. I mean, I think we did his last public interview here on the Seagull Talks. Um, Ebony, uh, last question for you. Let's say New York cultural funding, theatrical funding would work differently and instead of billionaires putting 600 million into a structure like the Shed or Dillard's Island would say, listen, I give important, significant ideas, resources, I'm gonna say here's a million or two. Or what would you do? How would you implement um, um, this idea? of the city council meeting, a participatory democratic uh, engagement? Oh, well, that's a million dollar question for real. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, that's where I am right now in my fellowship yeah. um, at Princeton is thinking about the ways in which we can use resources, working with sponsors, working with customers, working with um, partners to, again, to scale this these ideas to a larger audience. I will, I'll say that we have a number of things that we are thinking about in- um, Tell us a bit, what would you do? What would you do? You would uh, train people, have a workshop center, or you would- So, so the idea is to actually create a university. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, right now we're calling the, the, the Enterprise School for Participation, but that's a placeholder um, for now. But the idea is that there is an online, a virtual and a, and a, in a, a real space where people can come to study this intersection of performance, arts and politics and, um, and community engagement. Um, and so that work requires a team, it requires space, it requires um, facilitators, performers, it requires materials and a marketing team. It requires a lot in order to, you know, to move this idea um, from, from where it is now to being to seeing the, these hubs pop up around the country that are resource to do the work in their own neighborhoods and communities. That's a fantastic. Listen, it could be real, and it's actually it's as so often it is just a question of funding. Um, Aaron, tell us a bit about the project you you're presenting uh, uh, right now at Apex Art Center, and when is the next city council meeting? Where can people participate well, or see it? The next city council meeting is happening in your town, wherever you are, um, every week. Yes, so, yes. Um, but the one you <laughs> kind of restate. So you go to I mean, city council meetings and watch it. I mean, Rimini Protocol, famously a German company, theater company, declared the stakeholder meeting of Mercedes-Benz a performance. And they wrote a performance script, say, who are the main actors? And people could go. And then when, because also they looked at the formal way of power, you know, shareholders really have nothing to say or very little, but they have to you know present what they're doing so it's a performative way so they put it in but i think you updated that a, a little bit but is there the one where you and mallory work is there another one coming up and what's happening at the abrams art center so there are like several things going on um i think that ebony and i and mallory are beginning to talk about like is part of this institution or series of programmings that we're thinking of in terms of pedagogy also, does it include versions of the performance that are restaged similar to the way that we restaged our original work? Um, but I can't say exactly when. I feel like, you know, the school version at Princeton will happen in the fall. Um, there will be other versions that we're working with a couple of test sites that are high schools um, in different cities, one in Pennsylvania. Um, and so those are beginning to brew and bubble. And I think those will be coming online in the next few months to a year. My project, actually, I have a performance running at the chocolate factory right now that is running for this weekend. It's called Nightkeeper, and it's actually very different from this work. It's a collaboration with um, an actor named Jahan Young, 
I'm a choreographer named Hilary Clark, a musician named Norman Westberg, who used to play with the band Swans. And it's a piece in very low light about insomnia. Um, so that's just like kind of like a little chamber theater piece. Mm -hmm. um, and then at Abrams, my project Perfect City that I started is now co-run. It's a multi-generational, multi-racial collective funded by Creatives Rebuild New York and through residency at Abrams. And we're doing a project called Invisible Guides and that happens in June. It's a series of convenings, um, a walking tour, Photoville exhibition um, created in collaboration with, <clears throat> excuse me, a photographer and survivors of domestic violence um, from a particular shelter on the Lower East Side. And the ultimate goal with that work is to say that the people who are perhaps most disempowered by our systems of protection, who are isolated by the systems that are meant to protect them, would be the ideal people to plan a better city. Um, so that project is under the auspices of Perfect City, um, co-run it with Tiffany Zaria and Jamori Snipes. And um, it kind of takes some of the departure points of city council meeting and this work into a realm that is less defined in terms of its form. So we mm -hmm. do round tables, we do walks, we do do performances, and there's visual art and, and photography that goes with it too. Fantastic. And what's happening at Mallory Mines, at uh, Mallory, at Mabu <laughs> Mines? <laughs> Oh, um, wow. Um, a lot of things in development. Um, we, so I'm working on a new opera. Um, Carl Hancock Brooks is working on a new piece called Verses. There should be a workshop of that in the fall. Um, yeah, we're, we're just, and then there's going to be a reconstruction by David Newman of, um, Saint and the Football Player. Um, which we did the 50th. So there's a lot of things brewing, new things brewing, and um, hopefully doing some touring. Hopefully we'll tour Joanna Glyce's Mud. And yeah, so. Um, full plate. Ebony, what's, what are you what doing next uh, to your university? Yeah. Yeah, um, I'm working on a piece right now that goes up May 13th at Weeksville Heritage Center. It's called The Keeping. Um, it is a processional multi-site performance that happens on the whole campus of the Weeksville Heritage Center. For those who don't know, um, Weeksville is a community that was founded in 1838 in Brooklyn in what is now Crown Heights. And I've been the artist in residence there for the last couple of years. So this will be my culminating um, um, project. Um, and which is also um, funded by Creative Capital. So we're wrapping that up on May 13th and all of the things related to pre-production are happening now. <laughs> Fantastic, amazing. I think this is such a complex, interesting, beautiful, and I think really contemporary uh, project that anticipates a future, the role theater performance can do. So many much more. We could have talked about Gavin Kruber's involvement, the great Jimmy Van Bramer, the councilman who participated, and um and 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 so much more but you know i'll get the book and mallory show the book again from the iowa press you it because mine is oh here the city we make together so it is a brilliant concept and i think it is what is really needed we have to book help to put also new york city together you know the uh, post-covid uh, depressions um the disengagement the disillusionments the rising violence you know that comes because people do not see a future i think there's a, a very important essential role theater can and should play and I think your way to deal with it your interpretation of what is the most urgent necessary theater at the moment and where you put your life's work in I think it's was brilliant um, all my respect uh, over that time of something that does not sound uh, from the outside as exciting you know as a new Chekhov interpretation or another Shakespeare or uh, something so this is really brilliant work also close to the visual arts Claire Bishop's work you know of the artificial health you know what she says uh, we have to actually see the history of art also through the performing arts and how do we get beyond the white uh, cubes and black boxes and participate Tanya Bugera's work and so so much more so just fantastic thank you both we're going to have a signing of the book at the Siegel Center, April 13, 5 p.m. If anyone can come and come over, invite all your friends, and maybe you bring also people who participated to really celebrate the publication. Theater artists are not as great often in documenting their work. Visual artists are very good, very trained. Theater people uh, a bit hesitant. We just still don't have books on the great history of the public theater or 
uh, I don't know, the CT company, I guess, in some way. So um, so this is a, an important uh, project. And so thank you all for participating, Mallory, Aaron, also uh, Ebony, and all the best. And I will try to participate as much as I can. And to our audience, thank you for taking the time to listen. Now, so much more is online. So many more talks. When we started out, there were much less in the corona time. But um, this isn't really a significant um, uh, conversation. And again, it also means the work of artists. What does it mean for your life? I mean, Ebony talked about it. How do you change? What would it mean for you to participate in a different way? How, why don't you go to a council meeting or in the place, the house, the street you live? How can we change the city we live in and can be part of the change we actually want? So thank you very much. Thanks to Talia and thanks to VJ and Thea from HowlRound for hosting us. And I hope to see you all soon. Bye. Thank you.